Hats on the Grand, and it's held October 2016. This year, we had the vendors do the demos, and On Point came to record the demos. This next demo you're going to see is from my friend Mary Smulligan. She owns a quilt shop called Custom Quilts Unlimited in Fenville, Michigan. Mary's demo is all about machine applique, and she's using some really pretty designs from laundry basket quilts. Hello ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm here to show you and tell you a little bit about free motion machine applique and the perfect blanket stitch. Now the industry has really gone to pre-cuts and those are where you buy the, your packages of silhouette pieces or your applique pieces and they come all pre-cut with fusible on it and a lot of times they come with a background fabric, okay? And how many people have done machine applique? Okay, all right. Now I'm going to go over a few of the basics with machine applique just in case you don't know this. Now as long as you have a machine that has a blanket stitch um, button on your machine, um, when you push that, it'll automatically set your, your stitch length and your, and your stitch um, width. You can always change that. You can dial it down or dial it up depending on how, how wide you want your um, blanket stitch and how far apart you want your pieces. Okay? So um, does everybody know that, that that's on their machine and they can do that with all the stitches? That's great because some people don't know that and they wonder why I get such a fine um, blanket stitch and it's just because I dialed it down. All of this pre-cuts that we sell are all on batiks, okay? And did you know batiks don't fray? So we do the raw edge machine applique. So then you, if you would like the satin stitch, where you're, which is just a glorified zigzag really, where it's real close together, um, that's more or less for, fa for regular fabric that's gonna fray. But when you're doing batiks, you can get away with a pretty big blanket stitch because that fabric's not going to fray up once it's washed, okay? But I still like to do a fine, fine blanket stitch, a small one. But when we get into some of these pieces on here, some of these small, intricate pieces are very um, thin, narrow, small pieces. I don't know if you can see this little stem right here. So this stem is so small. If I try to do a blanket stitch on that, it's, all you're going to see is thread. You're going to lose the fabric. So what I do is free motion machine applique. And that's where I put in my quilting darning foot. And I sew about a quarter inch away from all of the edges. Can you see the difference between the blanket stitch and the, the machine applique stitch? I mean the free motion machine applique stitch like on this butterfly here. Instead of quilting it, I'm appliquing it. Now you can also quilt it at the same time as applique. I don't do that because I like the wool batting. What it does is it gives it more of a three-dimensional look. See how it kind of sticks out? You can see the quilting a little bit better with the wool, but it gives it a puffier look. Some people call it um, terpuntal. They says, oh, that's Trapunto. No, it is not. It is just a 100% a, a wool washable batting by Hobbs. Okay? It's one of the best wool products on the market. Um, it's really all I use now for quilting. But the other important thing with machine applique is you need to have a stabilizer behind it. And I like this 100% cotton fusible. It has a sticky side. Can you see? It's kind of shiny on that side, and it's dull on this. This is 100% cotton, fusible, and if you put that on the back of your applique, it's going to give your, your stitches something to grab. Okay, so um, anytime I do machine applique, whether it's with the blanket stitch or the um, free motion applique, I always use the stabilizer. Okay, um, it's, have you ever done machine applique with the blanket stitch and it keeps like puckering your fabric as you go? When that happens, that, that's because you didn't have enough fabric for it to grip. So that's why we do this 
infusible. So I won't use anything else but this 100% cotton fusible. And we do sell it at our shop and at our booth. So then, once I have all my applique done, I'm going to layer it with the batting. And now I'm going to quilt kind of heavily on the background to make all of this pop out like that does. Okay? If you machine applique and quilt at the same time, you're not going to get that puffy look. Okay? So I like to do all my applique before I layer my, my sandwich. So to do a um, free motion machine applique, you do need a quilting darning foot, okay? An open-toed one is the best when you're doing this. So you would change over from your um, open-toed foot when you're doing um, applique. So let me sh see if I can show you this. This little foot here is an open-toed applique foot then let you see where you're going okay um that, i think that's very important if when you're trying to do applique and you can't see where you're going it's a problem so get an open-toed foot but to do the free motion machine applique we're going to change this this um foot here to a quilting darning foot but instead of quilting we're going to do free motion machine applique which makes it very fast, okay, very fast. Um, we're going to change it over to a straight stitch, okay. Stitch length doesn't matter because we have a quilting darning foot, okay. So it doesn't matter what's your stitch length at when you're doing free motion, even quilting or, or applique. So let's take one of these little circles because circles are hard to do with the, um, with the blanket stitch. And I'm just going to sew close to the edge on here. And it doesn't matter if it's far away. You know, as long as it's about an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch, you'll be fine. I'm going to pass some of this stuff around so you can see it. Um, I, have, I have a blanket stitch on here, which is two different sizes. And then I just did a free motion machine applique here. And when you get these little bird's nests, do you get these when you start with your free motion machine quilting? I just cut those off, but if you hold your bobbin thread and your top thread and pull your bobbin thread up, you won't have that, but I just cut them off. So Nancy's going to show this around a little bit, and you can take this one too, Nancy, if you'd like. And then that way you'll see the difference and see the finished product. So. The main thing with when you're doing your blanket stitch and you keep skipping stitches, okay, when it skips stitches and it doesn't look nice, and you'll probably find some of that on there, what I like to do is take the silicone spray, which is for sewing, okay, um, some of my tips are on the can, and what it does is you spray your fingers with this and rub your needle. That's going to take all the gum and the glue off from your fusibles, which are those are the fusibles they say do not gum up, <laughs> and they do. So we're going to take that rubber needle that's going to take all the glue off. It's going to keep it from building up. Now our stitches aren't going to skip as much. And if you still have problems, it is the bigger the needle, the better for machine applique. If you have too small of a needle, it's going to keep skipping on your blanket stitches. So I like to piece with a size 9 needle, which is very small, but I do applique with a 12. Okay, I've tried it with a 9 and it skips too much. It's just too small of a needle. So anytime your machine is skipping stitches, and this doesn't matter whether you're quilting, piecing, or whatever, try bumping up to a larger size needle. I use a 12 for um, applique and I piece with a 9 and I quilt with a 14. So. Um, it, just try changing your needle size. It, you wouldn't believe the difference that a, a different size needle would make. The other thing with machine applique is I never strive for perfect, I strive for finished. Okay? Um, I'm probably not perfect at anything in life, so I don't think that I'll be perfect at machine quilting or machine applique or piecing either, but that don't stop me. I've, I do them the best I can, and then move on. If I make mistakes, 
with the machine applique, I will take it out. With machine quilting, I don't. Once it's machine quilted, it's in, it's in, and I move on. But um, I never strive for perfect, I just strive for finished. And I know a lot of you people do like your, your hand applique with your needle turn. Um, laundry basket quilt does make a snippet. And what a snippet is, it's these shapes cut just a little bigger with no fusible on them. So now you can needle turn too. And she has about four different packs that are um, snippets. So for those of you that still want to do the machine, um, the hand applique, you still can use her products. Okay. Um, Adita Sitar is the designer of these quilts um, from Laundry Basket Quilts. She is actually from Poland, but she lived in Michigan for about 20 years. She just moved to California, so we miss her dearly. But she's a wonderful lady, and don't be afraid of machine applique. It's very fast and easy. These little ones that I'm um, passing around, they're $30, your background fabric and your pre-cuts, and you can probably get one of these done in four to six hours. That's completely with binding and everything. And they also make wonderful gifts, okay? She has about 250 patterns, and we have silhouettes for 75% of them. Okay, so um, don't be afraid of machine applique. It works very well. Um, just, a, just go ahead and just do it. Don't worry about being perfect, ladies, okay? And don't be afraid of those pre-cuts. They're very, they're very fun. So uh, thank you for joining me today, and I hope you all enjoy the show. I hope you try that technique from Mary. Using those pre-cut applique designs makes a project really easy. ...company called Quilt Art. Her designs are all based on Celtic designs. They're really great designs and I think you're going to like her technique. Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Andrews. I own a company called Quilt Art. I'm based in Rochester Hills, Michigan. Um, today we're going to talk about Celtic Made Easy. Um, it does look a little intimidating and we're going to break it down into making it super, super simple. Um, the Celtic that you're seeing on all three of these quilts, the Celtic part is the same, but then I've just put different finishing techniques on each one of these. Um, this one is probably the easiest one. The um, area on the out there is done with one large strip set since all of those design strips are exactly the same. You make one big strip set, cut it into the width that you need, and then it's just borders put around a center. So that one finishes up very, very quickly. So let's just get right into the, uh, into the meat and potatoes of this. Um, we're going to start with the easiest way to trace the design onto the background. Um, I used to use a light box, which is fine, um, but it can be a little tricky with the black fabric, being able to see through it. Um, so what I've gone to is using transfer paper. And this is the transfer paper that I use. Um, this is the kind of paper that we used when we made dresses and were doing um, darts. In the, uh, in the dresses. So this way with the transfer paper we're able to layer the background fabric, the transfer paper on top, and then I have the uh, Celtic pattern on top of that. And the, oh, the only trick to this is make sure that you use a pen that's not black. The template is in black and if you start tracing in black you won't see where you traced. So if you're tracing in red you're going to be able to see where you have traced. And it doesn't take long to, to go ahead and trace all of this. And the pattern does include all of your intersections so that you know where your pieces are woven over and under. And that's one of the um, things with Celtic is that Celtic is woven over and under. So at every intersection, if one intersection is over, the next one is gonna be under and then over, under, so it's a very predictable pattern. Um, so as you're working it, if you have an over intersection, you know both sides of it on the other sides are going to be under intersections. So it's a very logical progression uh, going, through, going through that. So once we have the background design drawn, we're going to start making the bias tubes. And what I do is, this is a one, year, one third yard fabric, 
and I'm cutting on a 45 degree angle to the salvage. And this way, when you're cutting on the bias, this is called cutting on the bias, when you're doing that, it gives you the fabric the ability to bend a little bit without having puckers. Um, so very important to do this um, on the bias. And now I'm only doing strips this long. I'm not going to do continuous bias because as I said, the um, Celtic is woven over and under and we'll be able to hide our tails in an under intersection. So you're always going to start at an under intersection, take a tube as far as you can go to the next under intersection that you get to, and then just cut it off, or it might even travel that far, and then just start a new one. So you don't have to make miles of continuous tubing to be weaving through. So we're just going to be making the, uh, the smaller tubes there. So once we cut, uh, what we're going to be cutting one inch strips of fabric. Let me actually move this and bring this so you've got a better background. Uh, we're going to be cutting one inch strips of fabric and then we're going to fold the fabric in half and we're going to fold it so that the right side is on the outside we're not going to be turning these inside out so we've already got the right side on the outside and then we're going to sew it closed with a one inch excuse me with a one eighth inch seam allowance and that way with the one eighth inch seam allowance you don't have to trim it and it will make this bias tube finish just a little bit wider than a quarter of an inch. I'm going to be showing you in a minute tape that I use to tape this to the background and the tape is a quarter inch wide. So I want to make these bias tubes just a little bit wider than a quarter inch so you're not catching it in your needle. So once you have that eighth of an inch seam done on your tube, all you're going to do is take this one you're going to insert your, you've, you've got a press bar, and actually let me show you this real quick. Um, this is a set of five press bars so that you have all different sizes. The size that I'm using is a quarter of an inch. So you take the press bar, and that is just going to be inserted into the tube, just like that. And then you're going to spin that seam allowance to the back of the tube. You're going to press it, and then your tube is ready to use. So the tubes are very, very simple to make. And now at this point, I'm going to take a different tube over here. At this point, this is where I can put the double-sided tape on the back here. And so I'm going to just do this very quickly and just lay this out on the back. And I'm going to be using this tape instead of using pins. Um, pins can create a little bit of distortion and with using this double-sided tape I'm able to get the perfect circles and also the other advantage to using the tape is that if you're going to do hand applique you don't have any pins in there and as you're pulling your um, applique thread it's not catching in any pins so you can just keep on stitching it's not going to catch on anything and it goes very very quickly so we've got the tape on the back here and I'm going to release the paper from the, uh, from the back of the tape, hopefully. And I just pull the paper off. Now one thing that I like to do is, I like to really, the tape is all the way across the back here. I like to run my fingernail down and release it from the tube so that the tape is actually only sticking to the raw edge here. So that way when we start going around curves, the tape is not, on, is not on this part of the tube, it's only on this part of the tube. And then once you actually get it laid down properly, then you can press it firmly and the whole tube will be adhered uh, to the background. So let me show you on here, this is, a, this is a paper template. And I'm actually going to show you, I'm not gonna show you a circle, I'm gonna show you this arc right here because this point is a little bit different. Going around circles is going around circles. Um, but as I said before, you definitely want to start at an under intersection so that eventually you will be, your um, tail will be covered up. So I'm going to start right here so, because I'm going to do this tube right here. And for this particular tube, right here is an under intersection for this tube. And now here's one other point here that I want to point out. Um, whenever you can, you want to have this raw edge facing the outer edge of your curve. I'm going to show you on this one here. Let me show you this way. 
when you have the um, when you have the raw edge facing the outer edge of your curve, when you curve it, you get the um, bulk distributed very nicely. When you have it facing your inner edge, like this, it starts to buckle. So you're much better off having your raw edge facing the outer. Let me turn this over having the raw edge facing the outer edge of your curve. And it will just go around the curves more smoothly. So let's take this over here. And I have the raw edge facing the outer edge of the curve here. And I'm going to start at the under intersection. And I'm just going to lay this down. And I'll just go up to this point here. And you can see how nice and smooth that lays down without any pins. And now for this point here, um, it's just like a miter on a binding. So all I'm going to do is fold this back on itself. And I want this line here to be parallel with this edge as I fold it back. And then when I fold it towards itself, again, back to itself, it's going to lay just like that. And then I will continue with this tube until I go to the farthest under intersection that I can get to. And it looks as though it's going to be right here. So at this point, I would cut this off right here, and then I would be able to start a new tube at that point and continue on. So you don't have to make the miles of continuous tubing. Um, now, let's get into uh, the stitch a little bit here. Um, the stitch that I do, um, a lot of people balk about hand applique, um, but for mine, mine are all art pieces. I treat mine like oil paintings. They're never going in the washing machine. So with that said, basically what I'm doing with mine is I'm basting them to the background. So I'm going to show you here. You can see how far apart my stitches are. They're about a half inch apart. But for this, for it being a wall art, not a problem. I would not do this for a bed quilt, but for wall art, not a problem. And my quilts actually travel quite a bit, um, and they're holding up just fine. So that, that is not an issue. And I'm going to show you this stitch that I use um, to make it invisible, because as you can see, most of the stitching has been done on this piece, and this stitching is quite invisible. So this is the stitch that I do. I am going to be, I'm going to, on the down stroke, I am only going through the background fabric, and on the up stroke, I am going to go through the background and the tube. So on the down stroke, I am actually going to push this tube back a little bit so that my needle can actually get kind of underneath it at that point. And then I'm going to let my needle travel about a half an inch. I'm going to bring it up through the edge of the tube and then pull it through. And you see you have a very invisible stitch there. So you're going to go just down through the background, push your tube back a little bit, go down through the background, and then come up and catch the edge of the tube, and then pull the, uh, and then pull the thread through. So you get very nice invisible stitches that way, but you can also make them very, very long. So this, the applique will finish up very, very quickly on that. And now I think the last thing that I'm going to show you, I've been asked to, oh, let me talk about this double-sided tape for a second. Um, this is the double-sided tape that I use. This is a wash-away tape so that if you don't want it in your project, you can dip it in water and it will, and it will release. Um, but I have found this is the easiest way to get those perfect circles and not have to have pins in your project. Makes it very, very easy. Um, the last thing I'm going to show you. Um, I've been asked to show you, uh, quite a few of my quilts have the bling on them, have the Swarovski crystals on them. And uh, what I'm using are the Swarovski hotfix crystals. And so what you will do, hotfix crystals already have the glue on them. And so what I will do is I'm just going to pick up a stone and I'll place it wherever I, I want it to be. And this is actually going to be on your finished quilt top. And even on my, um, like on this one, this has holographic thread in it, which is like a plastic thread. This doesn't melt it. I thought the first time I did it, I was just going to see that stitching just and, uh, and it doesn't melt it. So all you're going to do is this, this is your heat tool and you're just going to put it right on top of the stone for 10 seconds and that's it. And you've got your, and you've got your Swarovski crystals um, for the occasional quilt. You've got the nice little twinkle uh, to go along with it. But thank you very much for having me. 
I really love Kathleen's designs. I love how she takes one Celtic design and puts it in so many different quilts. And you might not have been able to see it from the distance, but she uses a lot of crystals on her quilts, makes them really fabulous.